Welcome to the ABT Show. I'm your host, Wally Drangmeister. Today on the ABT Show, we're visiting with Terry Keen of the Artichoke Cafe. He has the distinction of being involved with a restaurant that's been in business for 28 years. And we're going to get his perspectives on all things to do with the restaurant industry and in particularly his restaurant, as well as a look at the downtown area, past, present, and future. 28 times, uh, 28 years doing business in the downtown area is uh, gives him a unique perspective. Terry, welcome to the ABQ Show. Great to have you here. Thank you for inviting me, Wally. Yeah. It's great to be here. Now, the uh, the Arctic Choke Cafe uh, is a fantastic restaurant uh, in the what's called now the Edo or East Downtown area. I don't think it was even called that when you started, or maybe no, I just no, wasn't. No, when we started, it was Huning Highland. Yes, Huning Highland neighborhood. Yes. Now called Edo, which is kind of a, a hip city vibe thing to call something. It is. Yeah. But tell us just a little bit uh, how did the restaurant get started all, uh, you know, some 28 years ago, and what is it you're doing at the Artichoke? Okay. Well, um, it actually started in 1989, August 21st of 1989, and August of this year will be our 30th anniversary. Okay, so that's a couple off. That's yeah, fantastic. it's okay though. Um, I always like to be accused of being <laughs> younger than I am. Um, so 30 years ago, my wife and I came back here from New Jersey and we had opened our very first restaurant in New Jersey, and we called that the Gold Coast Cafe. Mm -hmm. It was in Hoboken, New Jersey, okay. the birthplace of Frank Sinatra, <laughs> and uh, right across the street from, uh, right across the street, right across the Hudson River right. from New York City. Right. We loved being there. We had our, our son, Evan, um, was our only son at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so he grew up in that little restaurant for about three years we owned it. We sold it, and my wife is from New Jersey, so we went back there. Her sister was a partner with us, her sister's husband, and we went back, ran it for three years, owned it. After three years, we decided that, uh, actually, my wife decided she didn't want to be in New Jersey anymore. She wanted to go back to New Mexico. Right. Fell, she had fallen in love with New Mexico, and um, as we all do, I hope. Um, so she came back, and I came back, and we brought our oldest son, Evan, and our next son, Gavin, and opened the Artichoke Cafe back in August 21st, 1989. And we bought the building at the time that we got there, and everybody was, you know, we had friends saying, you can't buy this building, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's, you're, you're in a terrible neighborhood. This is a slum. There's nothing here. It's crime-ridden. There's this, there's that. But what they didn't understand is that we had come from Hoboken, New Jersey. And it looked like the <laughs> suburbs to us. I thought to myself, geez, this is great. And I don't know what you guys are talking about. So we bought it and struggled through a few years trying to get people to come. And then it started to hit its stride, and now we are where we are. Right now, talk about the food at the Artichoke. How would you describe it? Well, Besides the food, delicious is how I describe thank you. it. So. The food <laughs> is uh, a creation uh, of my wife, Pat, who went to culinary school in New York. And when we left Hoboken and came back to New Mexico to open the Artichoke Cafe, she had gotten her degree in basically white tablecloth fine dining restaurant. Um, Kind of that French dining it's influence, French, you know. Italian. Yeah. She's she's Italian. Okay. So it's Italian, French, right. and and New American. Right. You know, they're um, it, and it always has been. But she's been always very active uh, uh, in planning the menu. And in the beginning, she cooked lunch and dinner for the first couple of years we were there, while she was trying to make sure that the kids were, you know, taken to preschool and kindergarten and all the other things. And when she got to the point where the restaurant was being a little more successful, um, we were able to hire some people in that could help her with that. And she was uh, able to step away a little bit, but she's still totally involved in planning the menus and the food, the type of food that we do serve there, which is what you just said, Italian, yeah. French, New American. Yeah. Well, um, 
I know the restaurant industry is one of those businesses, <clears throat> like many, where you're only as good as your last meal. So exactly. there's no resting on your laurels. But what was a sign to you that you maybe had arrived back in the old days? Was there a guest who came in? Was there a, an event you did? Did somebody give you some feedback? No what? specific mm -hmm. guest, no specific event. But as I said in the beginning, it started out slow. There was a night when we first opened the restaurant. We were, we'd been open for two weeks. Two people came in for dinner. Right. And I sat there looking at those two people going, hmm, maybe this wasn't the best idea. <laughs> but then it started to grow. And it went from two people to 20 people on a regular basis, then to 40 and 50 on a regular basis, and to now it's 100 and 150 and 200 on a regular basis. And that took about two, three years before I really started feeling comfortable that we were going to catch on with the patrons of Albuquerque. I mean, remember, this restaurant had been closed for over a year and sat empty. Um, we left the name The Artichoke Cafe because when we left Albuquerque, it, has, it was still open, and we thought, and, we, and my wife and I would go down there for lunch. It was only open for lunch at the time, and it was a cook shop. We'd go down there for lunch and have a grand time. Mm -hmm. So when we came back, we thought, hey, let's leave it, the, let's leave it the Artichoke right. Cafe, and we did. All right, fantastic. Yeah. Now, uh, you've been there for a long time. Uh, tell us, uh, uh, to the extent that uh, copyright laws and the witness protection program will allow, uh, <laughs> Who are some people that you've had come through there that was was a treat for you? I know, I think I've seen every major political figure over the well, years. Well, we have. Who are some that stick out in your mind? Um, okay. Um, we won't put me call on these the your spot. Favorite. We'll call these memorable. Yeah, these They're are these memorable. are people. Uh, John Kerry came through okay. a couple of times when he was running for president. Right. Um, Nancy Pelosi has come. Uh, uh, Governor Martinez has been there many, many, many times. Uh, Bill Richardson used to come in late at night after, um, after boxing events. He would bring a small entourage of like five or six guys. And after we'd closed, Bill Richardson would come down, have dinner after the, uh, after the boxing uh -huh. match. And so we'd stay open f for as late as he needed to be. Yeah. And um, then we also have... And I'm terrible with names of movie stars, but we do have the occasional movie star come through that is, uh, you know, whose name I don't know. Unless you're Clint Eastwood, I don't know who you are. <laughs> That's how I am. If my wife were here, she would be able to set me straight. Well, I, you know, I love your restaurant for dinner in the evening, but for a place to have a, business, a nice business lunch, I've had some actually very successful it's one of those restaurants that has a nice ambiance. It's not so quiet as to be spooky, but it's not so noisy yeah. that you can't have a business conversation. And uh, I really do like the setup, and that's, it's one of my favorite places Thank to you. go. And if anyone ever says, let's have a business lunch at the Artichoke, I'm like, yes, that's yeah. a fantastic thing to do. So. Well, years ago when we remodeled the, uh, the restaurant, we, um, we put in two private dining rooms in the back. And those private dining rooms are perfect for business lunches and dinners, special occasion dinners. I'm kind of promoting myself right well, that's now. That's all right. But to your point, we've also been um, nominated and, and chosen as one of the best places to have power lunches in the city of Albuquerque. Yeah. Well, and I think there's a reason for that. Yeah, so. well, we, we're, we're glad that we were considered. <laughs> Let's put it that way. All right, so uh, talk to me a little bit about the, uh, the transition you've seen in your part of downtown over the years. I know there's some things that have made, there's been some ups and downs. What are the memorable changes you've seen just in the neighborhood where your business is operated yeah. from over yeah, the years? Sure. Well, when we first got there, uh, the Albuquerque High lofts weren't there. It was a, it was the Albuquerque High full of, homeless folks and surrounded by um, fences, you know, right. hurricane fences, whatever it was. And then there were a bunch of bad, seedy hotels that basically catered to all those people that 
my friends warned me against before I bought the building and whose advice I didn't take. But, you know, there were there's prostitution and pimping and drug dealing and all kinds of things going on in that area when we first got there in 1989. The biggest change was when Rob Dixon came in and renovated the Albuquerque High into the Albuquerque Lofts and then continued to build other buildings around that for more lofts, bringing more people into the, you know, citizens, pedestrians walking around Edo has changed Edo significantly. Yeah, and it is, it is an area of town that when I drive through there, it is uh, encouraging to me. You see good things yeah. happening, so that's yeah. fantastic. I think art has uh, done a, a good job of kind of making Edo a little bit more desirable in my right. mind after all the Problems after the we construction. Had. After the construction. Well, uh, when we come back, we'll talk more about that. But before we go to break, for somebody who hasn't been to the Artichoke Cafe, how do you get there and where is it located? It's located right on the corner of Central and Edith. Uh, it's, four, it's 424 Central Avenue Southeast, just a little bit east of downtown. We're Broadway, uh, east of Broadway. Right, very good. Well, we're here visiting with Terry Keene of the Artichoke Cafe. When we come back, we will get uh, more of his perspective on how things are going in the east downtown area. You're watching the ABQ Show here on ProView Network. Locally loved restaurants like Farina Pizzeria, Farina Alto, and the Artichoke Cafe are the perfect venue for your next event. Farina Alto has traditional Italian food, plus handcrafted cocktails in a beautiful Northeast Heights location. Farina Pizzeria with a downtown vibe, amazing affordable wines, and local beer. And the Artichoke Cafe has set the standard for casual fine dining since 1989. Visit our family of restaurants and see what fine dining is all about. What is glamour? Frailty. What is desire, diamonds. They say a life lived without passion is hardly worth living. Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Dang, this one made me feel all special. Well, I'm going to the frontier, walk to the cashier, order up a root beer and a number one. Cover it with green stuff, one scoop is not enough. Find a booth is real tough, back by the Duke. Meet my family, meet my friends in the quirkiest restaurant I have ever been. All of Albuquerque's favorite spot, it's the Frontier Restaurant. The Frontier Restaurant is a proud supporter of ProView Sports Network. The New Mexico High School Coaches Association, established in 1941, is an organization of New Mexico's best and most professional interscholastic coaches. Coaches across work daily to help our student athletes excel in the classroom, on the field of play, and in our communities. Students that participate in interscholastic activities attain higher grades, higher graduation rates, and higher wages. Responsible for the North-South All-Star Games, statewide coaches award program, and providing multiple professional development opportunities for New Mexico's coaches. Be a great coach by coaching beyond the game. Dreamstyle Remodeling has been wowing homeowners in New Mexico since 1989. Selected as Best Custom Home Remodeler for three consecutive years by readers of the Albuquerque Journal, we're also your exclusive provider for top home improvement brands like Renewal by Anderson, Four Seasons, Blaze King, and many others. Founded and headquartered in Albuquerque, Dreamstyle Remodeling is family-owned and now employs more than 500 people across the southwestern U.S. In fact, we've helped more than 60,000 Thousand homeowners improve their home in New Mexico, Arizona, California, Idaho, and West Texas. We're committed to providing a superior customer experience. We've earned 4.6 stars with hundreds of online reviews and have an A plus with the BBB. Dreamstyle Remodeling is a proud supporter of UNM Athletics. Visit our beautiful 10,000 square foot showroom at 1460 Renaissance Boulevard across from Sam's Club or DreamStyleRemodeling.com to make your home remodeling dreams come true. Welcome back to the ABQ Show. We're visiting with Terry Keene of the Artichoke Cafe. Now, in the first segment, Terry, you mentioned a little bit that you think art now that it is complete 
has been a positive. Uh, talk to me about a couple of things. One, what was the struggle like while the construction? Where do you think we are now? Yeah. And then what do you look for when we actually get some buses in yeah, here and uh, things will go, go forward from there? Well, let me go back a little bit further than yeah. that into the history of it. We started uh, the BCCP, which was the Broadway Central Corridor, Corridor Partnership, which turned into the Edo Neighborhood Association. We were I'm kind of a charter member of both of those organizations. Um, as the Edo Neighborhood Association, what we tried to do uh, and what we were successful at doing was present the Edo Master Plan to the City of Albuquerque City Council. It got passed. Basically, in a nutshell, it was slow traffic down on Edith, make it much more pedestrian friendly, and um, that's kind of what art did for us without actually instituting the plan that we had approved by city council that never got instituted. So art came in, closed the street down for a year and a half, and made it difficult for all the merchants up and down central. Um, you know, sm everybody pretty much stayed in business. There were a few that probably didn't make it. But it did affect all of us um, by quite a bit of, um, you know, the percentage was pretty high. But we all made it through, and now that it's done, I really like the way traffic flows on Central. It's one lane in each direction with the bus lane, as you all know, but it's slow traffic down. It has a bike lane, which people can use. Pedestrians, it has parking on the sides of the street where there you didn't used to be parking on sides of the street. So pedestrians feel more comfortable walking a sidewalk which is now wider in most places, with a you know, four-ton car in between them and the traffic. So it's made it more pedestrian friendly. It slowed the traffic down. The buses, as you ask, Wally, mm -hmm. um, I'm, the only thing I'm really disappointed in, and I'm not really disappointed, but I was looking forward to electric buses, mm -hmm. because electric buses just sounded like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Less pollution, less noise, prettier buses, and now apparently we're going to be we're going to, I guess, smart diesel or clean diesel, right. which I'm not exactly sure what that means, but we'll see. Uh, we'll have buses back, and I don't expect it to be any different when the buses come back. It'll, it'll just be more traffic on the street, but it'll be bus traffic. Yeah, very good. Now, uh, talk to me about parking for, I, I think you have solved that problem. You know, it's one of those, if you don't have parking, a lot of times that can really constrain. It it I know it's not a challenge, but what's, how does that, imp how's that impacted your operation over the years? Well, it hasn't really impacted our operation over the years. We have, um, we've always had access to a parking lot directly across the street from the artichoke, where Farina Pizzeria is, another one of my restaurants, uh, is located. We were fortunate enough to be able to purchase that from the man who, who had that property years and years ago. Um, he was a retired dentist. So we've always had a lot of parking for the restaurant. We do have it attended, and that attended parking had nothing to do with safety as much as when we were renting the parking lot from this dentist that owned it, he required us to have a parking attendant out there so that people wouldn't park in his tenant's spots. We just carried that over. So now if you ever come down to the Art Show Cafe, you'll always see an attendant in the parking lot watching your car, lunch or dinner. Um, parking along the street has increased and we are able to have some parking on the side streets. But parking's never really been an issue for us. Well, and that's been my experience. And, you know, to just look at it, you think that might not be the case. But, yeah, that's exactly right. There's places to park there. It makes yeah, it great. It is. Yeah. Now, uh, there's a lot of uh, things going on, both at the city and, the, and at the state legislature, that may have an impact on uh, restaurants. Uh, if you'd be uh, so kind, I'd love to hear your take. I know there's a plastics ban that might impact the restaurant's containers they use for takeaway. Right, right. Are you, uh, what's your thoughts on that, and have you taken a look how that might impact your business? I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I think it's a good idea to do. Uh, we've already started doing it in all of our restaurants, paper straws, 
uh, plastic cups right now that are biodegradable, made from bio biodegradable products. We have paper bags at the artichoke, and we are ready to turn the, all that into paper and at all three restaurants. So it's not difficult to, to do what they're going to ask us to do as a restaurant. You buy, uh, you, know, you buy paper products instead of plastic products. It'll work. Now, in fine dining, I would imagine there's some call-in, carry-out, but not significant. Is that is that? We have true? a lot more call-in and carry-out at uh, Farina, yeah. and the pizzerias, and the uh, you know Farina and Farina Alto, which is our other restaurant up on Montgomery near Wantabo. But um, we use paper. To go containers for those, and uh, yeah, it's been working out okay. It works out great, right? Good. Yeah. Now another issue uh, that that they're I know they're dealing with right now in Santa Fe is to raise the statewide minimum wage, which that part may or may not have a huge impact in Albuquerque because we already have a higher minimum wage. But there's also the thing that's called this tip wage or tip credit, tip minimum. That at one point they were talking about making that the same as the minimum wage in Santa Fe. But now keeping it, uh, I know it's complicated, but do you have a way to explain to people what that tip wage is and how all that works? Because I know it's been very yeah. uh, controversial and a lot of people are really interested about it in and outside of the restaurant industry. Yeah. Well, it's a, uh, you know, a tip credit is what it's called. And tip credit is basically you're still required to make sure every employee that works for you makes minimum wage. If it's a tipped employee, a tip credit takes part of those tips into consideration against minimum wage. So, for instance, a server, if temp, minimum wage is 10 bucks an hour, and a server is making 5 or $6 an hour in tips, and they make five fifty an hour, which is minimum wage for servers in the city of Albuquerque now, that puts them, you know, in that $10, 10, $10 to $11 range. If they make more than that, they servers can make $15 or $20 or $25, depending on the night. So to take that away, um, as I understand it, what they wanted to do was, was pay everybody minimum wage, whether you're making tips or not. But then the servers got to keep the tips they made plus be paid that same minimum wage that the back of the house employees in a restaurant have. And um, that would be hard for restaurants to be able to, re to keep the back of the house people, kitchen hands, dishwashers, people like that, um, up to the same wage that servers are making. Right. It's hard to do. So yeah. I, hope, I hope they rethink the, the, the tip credit in Santa Fe, and I'm all in favor of raising minimum wage. Having said that, I think minimum wage at $10 or $11 an hour is doable. I think that um, nobody in my restaurant makes less than that right now. Well, and I was going to say, uh, the servers I've talked to, I haven't talked a lot personally, but I've uh, heard a lot talking in the media. Most, uh, most people who make tips tend to, over time, not have very much trouble making minimum wage, whatever it is. They right. tend to make a lot more. That's one of the reasons they like that profession to begin with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you're not going to find any servers that right. are making tips in favor of eliminating the tip credit. Right. They like the fact they make a little less in wages, but don't have to share you know, tips. Right. And they do share tips between right. service people that are directly come in contact with, right. uh, with, with other patrons that come in the restaurant. Right. But the bottom line is if that tip credit maintains, uh, still stays in the law going forward, that, that would probably be a good thing from yeah, the perspective be a good thing. Of, of the industry and your restaurant in particular. It, here's what it is right now. In Albuquerque, it's 60% of minimum wage. And minimum wage goes up every year by CPI. So right now, minimum wage is nine dollars and twenty cents an hour servers make five dollars and fifty cents an hour next year when it goes up a few percentage points everybody gets a little bit more money yeah 
Um, uh, you know, it, and it works fine. I think there should be a cap on the tip credit, not necessarily the minimum wage, right. but I think the, the legislature should consider a cap on, on, on the tip credit. Right. All right, very good. Well, uh, talk to us about uh, some of the changes over the year. I know uh, your wife was the uh, primary and probably sole driving force behind the kitchen early on, but yeah. now you've gone to the point where uh, she's more of an executive chef and yes. has a chef. But uh, I understand you have a new chef. Talk about he, he and we, his talents and how that's do. working out. Martin Juan Martin Torres is our new chef. He was our sous chef at the Artichoke oh, 10 years ago or so, and then left to pursue um, culinary experiences in other places. He went out to the casino. Uh, Sandia mm -hmm. Casino is out there for many, many years. Went to another restaurant briefly in town. Uh, and then when we were losing our chef um, this year, Martin contacted me and uh, we got together and he came and it's been amazing. Martin has grown as a chef in so many good ways. We are so happy to have him with us. Pat, my wife Pat and I just can't tell you how happy we are to have Martin with us as well as the things that he's doing in the restaurant, which are amazing. We'll talk about some of the things he's doing. And if I were to go there, what, you know, from afar, and I know that uh, the folks watching will have different tastes, but yeah. what are some of the things that you'd recommend, uh, the dishes that you've got going on at the, at the restaurant right <sighs> Gee, now? Gee, I'd recommend almost everything he's cooking <laughs> right now. Um, we, you know, we, uh, we do a, 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 prime, a, a prime New York steak. We do a very nice tenderloin. We have scallops, we have shrimp, um, we have a ravioli, which is a vegetarian item. We have lamb and pork, uh, just kind of the gamut. And he, we're starting a new spring menu, middle of March, as a matter of fact, middle of this month. So if you're interested in seeing what that spring menu looks like, Come on down to the Art Show Cafe, 424 Central Avenue, Southeast. And I know there's another event that's getting ready to happen. Restaurant Week that's is right. coming up soon, and that may be another opportunity. Uh, how, If people want to take it, when is Restaurant Week, and how would they get involved uh, with what you're doing as yeah. part of that? That Well, we're, we involve, we're involved with Restaurant Week every year. Uh, this year, it starts on Sunday, um, this Sunday. And, and goes through the following Sunday. We offer a lunch, prefix lunch menu, uh, three course prefix lunch menu, and a three course prefix dinner menu. The lunch menu is $25, the prefix dinner menu is $35. And it is a selection of, and I, I call it prefix, but you get to choose from four different entrees, a couple of different salads, a few different desserts. And the entrees are, of course, all complete meals with starch and vegetable and, and uh, center of the plate. It's going to be great. It's great every year. People love it. They I would recommend that if you want to come, you call 243-0200 and ask for anybody, Bradley, Terry, Pat, any manager, We'll take your reservation, and it'll be a busy little um, week, and we like doing it. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much. We've been visiting with Terry Keen of the Artichoke Cafe. Thank you very much for watching the ABQ Show on ProView Networks. Thanks a lot, Terry. You're very welcome.